Welcome to the GSMC Financial News Podcast, the show that delves into the ups and downs of the stock market, changes in the economy, and news from the worlds of real estate and technology. From breaking news on the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, or the overseas market, to updates on the bond market, if there's money to be made, we've got you covered. Welcome to the GSMC Financial News Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Virginia Lucci, coming at you live from my house in chilly Montgomery, Alabama. Fall has officially arrived, y'all, and my beloved Crimson Tide are going to play football on Saturday, so maybe things are looking up for 2020. I've got a pretty packed show for you today. Um, First, we're going to talk about word on the street and what's going on with some of the nation's biggest banks. Then I'm going to bring you an update on the Nikola story. And finally, it wouldn't be a GSMC financial news podcast without information on TikTok. So we're going to cover what the latest in the ByteDance versus United States scandal is. And I'm going to end the show with the top 10 most influential decisions that Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote in her tenure, during her tenure as Supreme Court Justice. So let's get to it. I want to give you my normal disclaimer. This is a show for entertainment purposes only. I am not giving financial, legal, or tax advice. And if you want financial, legal, or tax advice, please see a professional that can give you advice tailored to your needs. On Friday night, um, the world lost a true pioneer, someone who's always been a hero to me. Justice and overall superstar Ruth Bader Ginsburg lost her battle with pancreatic cancer. I know this isn't a legal or a news podcast, but I'd be remiss if I didn't honor this incredible woman's legacy. First and foremost, her memory is one of the biggest blessings to women around the, or across the country and around the world. She protected the rights of every single citizen of this country. Second, her passing has sent shockwaves across the financial markets. Before I could even process the news of her passing, battle lines between Republicans and Democrats were formed. President Trump said he would announce a nominee to replace her on the Supreme Court on Friday or Saturday, while Democrats contend the winner of the November 3rd election should choose the nominee after the Republican-led Senate in 2016 used that rationale to block a nomination by Barack Obama following the death of Associate Justice Antonin Scalia. Already, investors were preparing for the possibility of a contested election result. The looming fight over the composition of the Supreme Court makes the U.S. election even more important and heated than it already was and harder to call. Analysts widely expected the debate to further reduce prospects that lawmakers and the White House would be able to reach a deal on a new round of coronavirus aid as the economy is really slowing down. Analysts led by Michael Wilson at Morgan Stanley in a Monday note, said the market faces two distinct outcomes. One, either the Congress passes the CARES 2 bill and the recovery stalls, or Congress does pass the bill, which is good for the stock market, but bad for the long end of the bond market. So one of those things, one of those two things is actually going to happen. We just don't know what, how it's going to work. So Justice Ginsburg's death is going to add another element of risk to the timing of the outcome and is going to weigh on the market overall in the near term. And then there's just the general anxiety level surrounding the election and what some commentators fear could be a slide toward 
more conflict, and even more potential for a constitutional crisis in the event of a a contested outcome. The election was already seen as a potential risk event. Arguably, it's even more so now. And we can see that because Monday was an epic day on the street. Stocks fell on Monday as fears about the potential worsening of the coronavirus pandemic, as well as uncertainty on U.S. fiscal st- further U.S. fiscal stimulus rattled traders. The Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 509.72 points, or 1.8%, to close at 27,147.70. The S&P lost 1.2% to 3,281.06. The Nasdaq Composite closed just 0.1% lower at 10,778.80 points, after a late-day surge in tech stocks. At one point, the Dow had dropped more than 900 points. The S&P 500 fell as much as 2.7 points. That's a lot of volatility. Monday's decline marked the first time since February that the S&P 500 posted four straight daily losses. The Dow, meanwhile, had its worst day since September 8th when it dropped 2.3%. These declines added to what has been a downbeat month on the Wall Street. The S&P 500 is down more than 6% for the month of September, and the Dow has lost 4.5%. The NASDAQ composite has tumbled 8.5% month to date. That's huge. Concerns over another wave of coronavirus cases came as the UK reportedly considers yet another national lockdown to stop an increase in infections. Top UK government scientists said that, without further action, the country's infection rate could reach 50,000 per day. The country's benchmark, FTSE 100, dropped more than 3% on the fear. Here in the U.S., stocks that would be hit the hardest from another lockdown declined. So shares of Carnival Corps were down 6.7%. Southwest Airlines and Delta Airlines fell 5.8% and 9.2% respectively. Technology shares, which led the broader market off of this coronavirus lows and into record territory, have really been hit hard this month. Rebound, and they rebounded slightly at the end of the day, but shares of Apple rose 3% and Netflix gained 3.7%. Amazon eked out a small gain, and Microsoft advanced only 1.1%. But these stocks are still down very sharply for the month. For the market to hold these levels, buyers have to come into technology sector over the next week to 10 days, said Mark Chaikin, CEO of Chaikin Analytics. Without the impetus of the call option, buyers who helped propel the large gap tech stocks to extreme valuation it is unlikely that the subsequent rally can exceed the September peak. The S&P 500, Dow Jones Industrial Average, and the NASDAQ Composite were coming off their third straight weekly drop, making their longest weekly slide since 2019. Contributing to this slide is the BuzzFeed report that trillions of dollars in money connected to criminal activity are sloshing through global banks. The banks and the U.S. authorities know it, and they're not doing anything to stop it. These so-called FinCEN files depict a suddenly widespread phenomenon of criminals, corrupt officials, and terrorists taking advantage of lax banking oversight. These documents, compiled by banks, shared with the government, but kept from the public view, expose the hollowness of banking safeguards and the ease with which criminals have exploited them, BuzzFeed's team writes. Profits from deadly drug wars, fortunes embezzled from developing countries, and hard-earned savings stolen in a Ponzi scheme were all allowed to flow into and out of these financial institutions, despite warnings from banks' own personal employees. And five banks in particular, J.P. Morgan Chase, HSBC, Standard Chartered Bank, Deutsche Bank, and Bank of New York Mellon kept profiting from powerful and dangerous players 
even after U.S. authorities fined these financial institutions for earlier failures to stem flows of dirty money, according to the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. North Korea launders money through the United States and our banks using a conflict strategy involving Chinese shell companies to end run international sanctions meant to lock it out of the global financial system, according to NBC's Andrew Laren and Dan DeLuca report. Based on the review of the leaked documents, the suspected laundering by North Korea linked organizations mount- amounted to more than $174.8 million over several years with transactions cleared through U.S. banks, including J.P. Morgan Chase and the Bank of New York Mellon, according to the documents. J.P. Morgan handled transactions tied to the massive looting of public funds in Malaysia, Venezuela, and the Ukraine. I'm sorry, and Ukraine. The ICIJ reports. The bank also processed more than $50 million in payments over a decade the record show for Paul Manafort, the former campaign manager for President Donald Trump. Tainted transactions continue to surge through accounts at J.P. Morgan, despite the bank's promises to improve its money laundering controls as part of settlements it reached with U.S. authorities in 2011, 2013, and 2014. Now, as a financial person myself, I've had to take a money laundering course It was the first thing I did when I was hired by my company. So I know a lot of these institutions do take money laundering very seriously, but it sounds like J.P. Morgan isn't taking it as seriously as it should. Um, Also, HSBC, Hong Kong Savings Bank of Canada, allowed a Ponzi scheme operator to continue funneling millions of dollars through the bank, even after learning of this enterprise. The investment scam that HSBC was warned about was called WCM777. It led to the death of investor Ronaldo Pacheo, who was found underwater on a wine estate in Napa, California in April of 2014, and the scamming of thousands in the Asian and Latino communities in the U.S., the BBC reports. Regulators in California told HSBC it was investigating WCM777 as early as September 2013 and alerted its residents to the fraud. But HSBC did spot suspicious transactions going through its systems, but it was not until April of 2014, after the SEC filed charges, that the WCM777 accounts at HSBC in Hong Kong were shut. Banks said they couldn't discuss specific allegations due to bank secrecy laws, but Greg Baer, who heads the Bank Policy Institute, a lobbying group for the industry, said in a statement, quote, clearly there is more to the story, but unfortunately the reporting failed to unearth it, and the banks are legally prohibited from telling their side. In some cases, if the past is any guide, that story likely includes law enforcement asking a bank to keep an open an account, it has identified as suspicious so that law enforcement can track where the money is going and gather information and further evidence to support an arrest and conviction. Okay. Uh, Sure. (laughs) Okay, sure, Dan. Um, BuzzFeed investigation points a finger at the federal government for failing to adequately police misconduct. The Treasury Department's Financial Crimes Office collects suspicious activity reports, or SARs, from banks to share them with international counterparts and law enforcement. What it does not do is force the banks to shut the money laundering down. In the rare instance when the U.S. government does crack down on banks, it often relies on sweetheart deals called deferred prosecution agreements, which include fines but no high-level arrests. The Treasury Department's Financial Crimes Office said in a statement that unauthorized disclosure of SARs is a crime that can impact the national security of the United States, compromise law enforcement investigations, and threaten the safety and security of the institutions and individuals who file such reports. It said it had referred the matter to the Justice Department and the Treasury's Inspector General. Um... 
So that's an interesting story. And I'm going to keep following it because I think there's a lot more involved than just banks having lax money laundering rules. Um, I think there's a lot more that we're going to find out, especially Deutsche Bank has been under a lot of scrutiny lately. So as updates become available, I will pass them along to you. And with that, I am going to take a quick break. And when I come back, we're going to give you an update on a story that we covered in our last podcast on Nikola Technologies. So stick around. Are you a business owner? Someone interested in the latest news that might affect your business? Then check out the GSMC Business News Podcast, a show dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning business, technology, and the stock market. Get a head start on the day as we keep you updated on the latest goings-on on Wall Street, money, jobs, and technology. The GSMC Business News Podcast has you covered. segment, we talked a little bit about some potential criminal activity on behalf of some of the major banks. And in this segment, I want to also look at some financial misconduct, potentially. Um, Things are still going downhill for Nicola. See what I did there? Going downhill. Because their video showed a car that was going downhill instead of driving. Shares of the electric truck startup, Nikola, sank sharply on Monday following the overnight resignation of executive chairman and founder Trevor R. Milton, who has been fending off accusation of fraud raised by a large investor, Hindenburg, betting against the company. Now, Trevor Milton was like their Elon Musk. He is charismatic. He's a wonderkind kind of thinks outside the box and has really been doing a good job. But things have changed dramatically in the last week. The stock traded on the NASDAQ, and it tumbled over 30% at Wall Street's opening bell on Monday. Clawed back some of those losses in midday, but this is really the biggest, the industry's biggest rival to Tesla. I've said in in our last podcast, I thought of it kind of like Tesla's little sister, Um, but it's been in the crosshairs of short seller campaigns, accusing CEO of mismanagement and impropriety. It's been under pressure for more than a week after activist short seller Hindenburg researched issued an extensive report on September 10th claiming Nikola is an intricate fraud built on dozens of lies over the course of Milton's career. In that report, the short seller raised 53 questions for the company. Hindenburg's accusations have sent the company, once one of the year's hottest stocks, reeling and put Nikola under a regulatory microscope. For those reasons, Milton asked the company to allow him to step down. The focus should be on the company and its world-changing mission, not me. I intend to defend myself against false allegations leveled against me by my outside detractors, he added. For its part, Nikola has denied the accusations as false and defamatory and blasted Hindenburg's move as financially motivated to manipulate the market and profit from a decline in Nikola's share price. It's unclear whether Hindenburg's accusations are legitimate, but the market action appears to be playing right into the firm's hand. Nikola is now trading at a fraction of its 52-week high, near $94. 
The spike high hit in June after the company engineered a public offering via successful reverse merger. Last week, Bloomberg reported that the Securities and Exchange Commission is probing Hindenburg's claims. Nicola said in its response that it contacted the SEC and intends to fully cooperate with its inquiry. The Justice Department is also making an inquiry, according to Financial Times report. Shortly after Nicola's response, Hindenburg Research, which pointed out that the company answered only 10 of its 53 questions, categorized the company's rebuttal as a tacit admission of securities fraud. Yikes. In response to Milton's resignations Monday, Hindenburg Research tweeted, We think this is just the beginning. <laughs> Yikes. In an 8K filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission explaining its founders' reasons for stepping aside, the company noted that Milton will remain an unpaid consultant and will be making himself reasonably available to provide consulting services through the end of 2020. In the company's 10Q report issued last month, Nicola said it's highly dependent on the services of Milton, and its arrangement with the founder going forward reflects that relationship. Milton, who's come under a lot of scrutiny in the last couple days, agreed to give up his position and duties as executive chairman of the board, as well as all other board seats on the company's subsidiaries, according to the agreement dated Sunday. The deal strips the 39-year-old entrepreneur of any of his any say in the company and blocks him from attempting to influence any decisions for at least three years, according to a company filing with the SEC on Monday. Milton agreed to advise the company as an unpaid consultant on an ad hoc basis through the end of the year, but he cannot comment about the company on social media blogs, or other online platforms without legal approval from Nicola, according to the deal. The value of his exit package will vary over time as the startup shares have swung wildly since it went public in June. The agreement requires Milton to give up roughly $4.9 million in restricted, performance-based shares valued at $166 million as of Friday's closing price of $34.19 a share, while allowing him to walk away with more than 91.6 million shares that were worth over $3.1 billion. Nikola did decline to comment on Milton's exit package. The company also accelerated vesting on 600,000 restricted shares worth more than $20 million, allowing Milton to, share, to sell stock that was previously, unlocked, was previously locked up until June 3rd of 2023, sometime within the next six months. Milton really didn't give up as much since the restricted shares he forfeited were contingent on the stock's performance and his continued service at the company through that same date. So he probably would have lost that equity regardless, according to separate securities filing. So that's a lot of nothing there. But don't worry about him. Don't worry. He's going to be fine. As part of the agreement... The company committed to paying for reasonable cost of security inspection of Milton's residence, and it will reimburse him for up to $100,000 for a full-time security detail for three months. So he's safe. He's safe. That's good. Nicola also agreed to cover his legal expenses as long as they are pre-approved and to provide copies of all emails he sent or received through his Nicola email account, among other things, to aid in his defense. So really, he still has the entire company behind him in his defense of whatever claims the SEC or Hindenburg come up with. In the August filings, Nicola stated that if Milton were to, quote, discontinue his service to us due to death, disability, or any other reason, we would be significantly disadvantaged. Stephen Gursky, a former vice chairman of General Motors and a member of Nicola's board, has been appointed chairman of the board, effective immediately. Monday, Nikola tanked 20% by midday. Shares of General Motors also fell 4.8%. This comes after the two companies announced a partnership earlier this month, and the partnership is really what prompted Hindenburg's investigation. And, 
you know, this is not the first time that Hindenburg's research caused waves around the financial world. Last October, the group released a scathing report on Smile Direct Club. Anyone who's watched TV during quarantine knows that Smile Direct Club still exists, but the company has lost significant value. Smile Direct calls itself an orthodontics disruptor using a teledentistry business model that allows customers to receive clear aligners or dental braces by mail. Hmm. Customers can either get a free 3D image of their teeth taken at a smile shop or buy a kit online to make an impression of their teeth that they can then mail to Smile Direct. The company then de- develops and ships the clear aligners back and the customer undergoes a 5-10 to ten month treatment plan. The company's approach claims it requires no meetings with dentists or orthodontists, although dentists and orthodontists maintain that thorough oral exams are needed before undergoing any orthodontic procedure. Now look, I wore braces for five years. My teeth were so crooked that my baby teeth didn't even fall out. And I went to the orthodontist, or torture dentist as I like to call him, every other week to get them tightened or to get rubber bands or some other torture device. I'd like to believe that Smile Direct could fix slightly misaligned teeth, but I just don't understand how this could work on real problem teeth. And I'm an expert. Well, not really, but I feel like I am. I wore braces for a really long time. Smile Direct Club is taking the startup approach of moving fast and breaking things, analyst wrote. In this case, unfortunately, they seem to be breaking many of their customers' teeth. Here are the main reasons that Hindenburg was so bearish on the company highlighted in the report. First, a number of state regulators and medical organizations have declared the company's practices illegal. And at least two states, including Alabama and Georgia, yay, Alabama, dental boards have enacted rules that make some of the company's practices illegal, noting that complaints have been filed with the FTC, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and the Better Business Bureau, um, who have received more than 1,200 complaints about Smile Direct Club in its five years operating. The American Dental Association and the American Associations of Orthodontics have both spoken out against Smile Direct Club, alleging that it puts patients in danger by illegally practicing medicine. The company is, quote, another profitless unicorn incinerating cash at an accelerating race. Right. Hindenburg called it another ugly IPO that has somehow avoided even basic scrutiny and expected that the stock would be further cut in half several times over the next 6 to 12 months. And, you know, that's this came out before the virus. So obviously the markets moved in ways that we haven't really, we never really expected. But their stock fell 43% after the report. It went as low as $3.64 from a high of $21.10. So firms, research firms like Hindenburg are incredibly influential on the stock market and what sells and what doesn't and what firms tank. Now, in the case of Smile Direct, it doesn't sound like they were practicing the most ethical of practices. And I think that exposing their flaws to everybody is a good practice. And that's really going to be beneficial for everybody. But, you know, at the same time, I don't know how much research they put into this. I don't know where they're getting their information from. So, you know, it's just places like this come with a huge responsibility. And, you know, I don't necessarily think that they were that far off base with Smile Direct because the update um, is pretty incredible. 
as of Monday, shares were trading at $10.59, which is pretty much in the middle of where their, their prices were. CEO and chairman of the company, David Katzman, bought nearly 1.3 million shares this month for about $10.3 million. In September, it was also announced that it was launching a smile shop stores in the UK. Is this the latest in their good fortunes, a result of the rise in telehealth? Well, according to The Motley Fool, there was some significant momentum that was gained when Meredith Corporation's Foundry 360 content announced the launch of Telehealth Explained, a new platform for educating consumers about the benefits of telehealth. But I think that the purchase of, what was that, 1.3 million shares by the company's CEO kind of helped boost things. Is this a little bit of insider information? I don't know. I don't, all I know is that dentistry and orthodontia are really expensive. Since the pandemic, I've switched most of my appointments to telehealth, but I still go to the dentist in person because I don't want to subject myself to further cost or expense by getting shoddy treatment. Uh, honestly, I'm not making a Zoom appointment with my general contractor to build an addition to my house. I want somebody to come in, check out the beams, and make an educated plan. So I think investors will have to wait a couple of months to see what the company does in their third quarter or see if Hindenburg may have an update for us. I'm going to keep my eye on Smile Direct, and if anything of note comes out, I'm going to pass that information along to you. So I think it's time for me to take another commercial break. When I come back, I'm going to give you another update on another story that I've been covering. And if you stick around to the end of the podcast, I'm going to have a tribute to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and give you my top 10 of her opinions that I think have influenced our culture for the better. So stick around. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Thanks for sticking with me. Um, our last segment, I think, is pretty interesting. I want to see more results of Hindenburg's research, and I want to keep an eye on them because I think they've got some interesting things to say about some interesting companies. So I will keep you all up to date. And as you know, it would not be an episode of the GSMC Financial News Podcast, without an update on the TikTok saga. Sunday was absolutely frightening in my house. 
No TikTok, maybe? No WeChat? Well, we don't use WeChat, but you know what I mean. So how did we get here? Let me get everybody up to date. If you're not a regular listener to this podcast, you don't know the saga. So way back in August, I can't believe it was only last month, but I have no concept of time anymore. The Trump administration threatened to ban TikTok unless it found a U.S. buyer. Allegedly, it's because there's a national security threat. The app automatically captures vast swaths of information from its users, including internet and other network activity information, such as location data and browsing and search histories. This data collection threatens to allow the Chinese Communist Party to access Americans' personal and proprietary information, potentially allowing China to track the locations of federal employees and contractors, build dossiers of personal information for blackmail, and conduct corporate espionage. TikTok also reportedly censors content that the Chinese Communist Party deems politically sensitive, such as contents concerning protests in Hong Kong and China's treatment of Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities. This mobile application may also be used for disinformation campaigns that benefit the Chinese Communist Party, such as when TikTok videos spread debunked conspiracy theories about the coronavirus. Coincidentally, there was a call on TikTok back in June for users who are opposed to the president to reserve tickets to the president's Tulsa rally and not use them. As a result... The event looks less like a rally and more like an awkward seminar where people don't really want to listen to the fourth speaker of the day. TikTok, for its part, has vigorously and repeatedly denied that it passes U.S. user data through China or gives the Chinese government access to U.S. users' personal information. So last weekend, one time Dark Horse Oracle emerged victorious in a federally mandated contest to acquire TikTok. Microsoft and, Amazon, or Microsoft and Walmart were in talks to purchase the lucrative app, but that didn't happen. So September 20th was D-Day for TikTok, and it came and went. The Department of Commerce moved to prohibit downloads of apps, WeChat, and TikTok starting on Sunday. Then, both apps got a reprieve. For WeChat, a last-minute temporary injunction by a federal court in California stayed the ban. The Department of Commerce late Saturday issued a one-week extension bumping TikTok's theoretical ban from September 20th to Sunday, September 27th. At that point, you could still download, update, and use TikTok however you want inside the U.S. So... I thought that we weren't going to jump off this clip. Last week, I said that ByteDance had an agreement with Oracle. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin was going to urge the president to approve it. But it still took a judicial order to extend the deadline. So what happened? Okay, so the deal is that Oracle isn't actually acquiring TikTok at all. And Oracle and TikTok's current parent company, ByteDance, disagree on who's going to be in charge. The transaction, as we currently understand it, has ByteDance spinning off TikTok operations in the U.S. and most other nations to a new company called TikTok Global. Oracle will help hold a 12.5% stake in TikTok Global at its inception and will also serve as the cloud hosting provider for the new entity. Now, Walmart will hold another 7.5% stake. The remaining 80% will go back to ByteDance. The new company also plans to launch an initial public offering of its stock before the end of 2021. Okay, so that's what we know. What are the other conditions of the deal? Oracle and Walmart promised the TikTok global investment 
would bring 25,000 jobs to the United States, which Trump says will be based in Texas. Since U.S. investors, including General Atlantic and Sequoia Capital, own 50, 40%, I'm sorry, of parent company ByteDance, Oracle, and Walmart, so the U.S. investors will have a majority stake in the new company. Walmart said TikTok Global will go public in less than 12 months and be listed on a U.S. stock exchange. Oracle and Walmart said that their deal will add $5 billion in future taxes. They also added that they will create an educational initiative to teach a variety of courses, including basic reading and computer engineering, to students from inner cities using an AI-based video curriculum. The Financial Times reported that the direct majority of ownership and business control is likely to remain with ByteDance. In California, a federal judge blocked a ban on WeChat, stating that there are no viable substitute platforms or apps for the Chinese-speaking and Chinese-American communities. So I think they're safe for the time being. Well, so I guess this gives TikTok a reprieve, but what's in it for Walmart? Um, I think this could actually really help their tiny but growing advertising business. I mean, we all know Walmart's the big, biggest of the big box stores, right? Um, but they have a small advertising business that's kind of like Amazon's. On their own website, advertisers can sponsor their products to appear prominently in search or product detail pages. It also has a display advertising network, which lets advertisers reach Walmart customers on both the retailer's own digital properties and off-site, whether that's on websites or social channels like Pinterest. So it has... The Walmart Media Group advertises or boasts that it's got a massive scale and a massive reach, saying that 160 million customers visit its stores or websites every month and claims 90% of households have shopped at Walmart at least once in the prior 12 months. But in its 2020 annual report, the company said Walmart Media Group, along with fuel and financial services and related products, make up less than 1% of annual net sales. So by way of comparison, Amazon's really doing better at this type of advertisement, but this TikTok deal is going to, could potentially be a game changer. It also engages a young, energized user base. In general, analysts point to TikTok's large and engaged user base as an opportunity for Walmart, the Walmart ads business. In particular, the retailer is widely popular with young consumers seeking inexpensive wares they can doll up for DIY projects that they put on TikTok. So Credit Suisse analysts noted that TikTok's estimated 50 million U.S. daily users is a huge leap over the 1.5 to 2 million people who shop on Walmart U.S. every day. Nicole Perrin, an analyst with eMarketer, pointed out that Walmart's ad business is tiny but growing, and it has gotten supercharged during the pandemic with so many people buying groceries and other items online. So they're really in the market for some uptake. If I'm Walmart, I want to own that platform that's defining those cultural trends and really use it to inform my retail and e-commerce business. I'm sure that Walmart's also saying, okay, well, Amazon did a great job with it. And these influencer collaborated collections, TikTok could work with Walmart to have creators on TikTok come with, up with their own collections of products. Um, there's... One TikTok user who's developed a new line of makeup, and um, my stepdaughter and I went to Ulta the other day, and it was released probably the day before we went in, and the stock was completely sold out. So, you know, if 
certain influencers use a certain brand of tissues, they're going to be popular. I think this is a really good collab. The only potential hiccup is that other retailers could shy away from advertising on a platform that's partially Walmart owned. Um, Jordan Berkey, founder of Tamara Retail Consulting, who led Walmart's e-commerce activities in China for nearly a decade, said Walmart would likely follow in Amazon's footsteps with its handling of Amazon cloud clients, assuring advertisers their data is protected and not exposed to Walmart. Walmart in 2017 reportedly asked some tech vendors to stop using cloud apps that run on Amazon Web Services. Staunch opponents of Walmart may decide that they would like their money elsewhere, Berkey said, but keep in mind that Facebook is building a commerce business and Google is building a commerce business, so over time, there will be commerce connections and potential competitions with a lot of major media leaders. So I think we've come up with a resolution for TikTok. It's going to be a site for potential collaboration. Is that going to mean that it's going to become a little bit more commercial? I don't know. I think that's going to be seen. I mean, they give us free access to a lot of different music, which is not cheap. So, you know, it it all remains to be seen. This social media landscape is always changing. So who knows if TikTok is going to be the big thing in three months when this all gets together. So that remains to be seen. And with that, I am going to take another quick commercial break. And when I come back, I am going to give you um, the top 10 most influential decisions that Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg ever made. So stick around. This is near and dear to my heart. Do you work in the world of marketing and advertising? Are you a media buyer or the owner of an agency? Have you been looking for a podcast to help stay on top of all the goings on of those worlds? The GSMC Marketing News Podcast is dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning marketing and advertising. Get the latest marketing news from what major businesses have planned for the coming year to the newest trends in advertising from podcasts, digital and streaming to the old standbys of radio, television and billboards. The GSMC Marketing News Podcast has you covered whether you're a marketing agent or a business trying to expand your brand. sticking with me. Uh, In our last segment, we talked about maybe the last installment of the TikTok saga. I hope so, um, but we'll see. And in this last segment, I'm going to put my lawyer hat on. Um, As I mentioned at the top of the episode, I'm mourning the death of the notorious RBG, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. An icon in lace collars, she battled discrimination aimed at her. She was told that she didn't need a job out of law school because her husband could make money. I was told the same thing at a personal injury firm I worked at, but RBG rose above the fray with vigor. She was the first Jewish female and second female justice ever to serve on the Supreme Court. Ginsburg entered the position already a trailblazer, but it was her incomparable work ethic and tireless commitment to gender equality that truly set her apart. Here are 10 of her most influential decisions, including some dissents. And I'm going to try to keep this brief because I can go on forever, but here we go. At number 10 is the United States versus Virginia from 1996. At the time, VMI, or Virginia Military Institute, remained the only single-sex school among Virginia's public institutions of higher learning. 
Alumni of VMI Citizen Soldier Training were considered to be hot commodities because the unique curriculum was designed to prepare students for leadership positions in civilian life and military service using a specific type of training known as the advertisive method exclusive to the institution. Thanks to the competitive edge the institution gave alumni, VMI had the largest per-student endowment of all public undergraduate institutions in the country. The U.S. sued VMI and the state of Virginia, alleging that the school's males-only admission policy violated the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. The Equal Protection Clause prohibits states from denying anyone within the territory or state the equal protections of the law. The state argued that the restriction was fair game because women wouldn't be able to handle the rigorous nature of the program. But VMI attempted to cover its bases by proposing a parallel program for women called the Virginia Women's Institute for Leadership, located at a private all-women's liberal arts school called Mary Baldwin College. Where have I heard that before? Writing for the 7 to 1 majority, Ginsburg asserted, Virginia maintains methodological methodological differences are justified by the important differences between men and women in learning and developmental needs. But generations, or I'm sorry, generalizations about the way women are, estimates of what is appropriate for most women no longer justify denying opportunity to women whose talent and capacity place them outside the average description. Beautiful. (laughs) Number nine, I've got Olmstead versus Elsie in 1999. In the late 90s, two women with mental illnesses and developmental disabilities were voluntarily admitted to the psychiatric unit in the state-run Georgia Regional Hospital. Elaine Wilson had been diagnosed with a personality disorder while Lois Curtis was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Once they'd both completed treatment, the women were deemed ready for a move to a community-based program, but the move never happened. Wilson and Curtis were kept in the institution for several years after completing treatment, and Curtis eventually sued the state. The plaintiffs argued that the hospital was in violation of the Americans with Disability Act, or the ADA, Title II of the ADA protects qualified individuals with disabilities from discrimination on the basis of disability in services, programs, and activities provided by the state and local government. In its defense, the state of Georgia argued that it had been inadequate funding that had kept them from moving the women into appropriate program, not discrimination. Justice Ginsburg delivered the opinion of the court, siding with the plaintiffs, and stating that under Title II of the ADA, States are required to provide community-based treatment for persons with mental disabilities when the state's treatment professionals determine that such placement is appropriate. The landmark decision meant that public entities must provide community-based services to persons with disabilities when such services are appropriate. And that has huge implications. So it brings services to people who aren't in facilities. It's... Brilliant. Again. At number eight, I've got Friends of the Earth versus Laidlaw Environmental Services, a case from 2000. When Laidlaw Environmental Services brought a wastewater treatment plant, it was granted a National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, NPDES, permit that granted it permission to discharge treated water and limited pollutants. However, Laid law repeatedly released amounts of mer- mercury into South Carolina's North Tiger River that exceeded those limits, and eventually plaintiffs, Friends of the Earth, and others filed a citizen suit under the Clear- Clean Water Act, which regulates the discharge of pollutants. After the lawsuit began, Laid law began to comply with the permit and argued that the case was now moot, meaning resolved, because the company had corrected its wrongdoing. The Supreme Court wasn't having it. In a 72 opinion delivered by Justice Ginsburg, the court held that a case from a citizen for civil penalties 
doesn't have to be dismissed as moot just because the defendant begins complying with regulations after the litigation has begun. As my mom would say that closing the barn door after the horses have already left doesn't do anybody any good. So, you know, I think this is another example of that. At number seven, um, I've got a case that still gives me nightmares. It's 2000's Bush versus Gore. The state of Florida reported that Republican presidential candidate George W. Bush had beat Democratic presidential candidate Al Gore by just 1,784 votes. Because the margin was so slim, state law required an automatic machine recount, which shrunk Bush's lead to 327 votes. When the margin is that slim, Florida allows candidates to request a manual recount, which is just what Gore did in the four counties that traditionally voted Democrat, Volusa, Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade. The problem was, counties were given seven days to certify the election results to turn to the Secretary of State, and they were concerned they wouldn't make the deadlines. Three counties missed the deadline entirely, Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade. Florida Secretary of State Catherine Harris had required any counties who needed a later filing date to submit a written explanation of circumstances. None of the county's submissions met Harris's standards for an extension, so she went ahead and certified Bush as a Florida winner. Fast forward a few weeks to when Gore's campaign obtained an order from the Florida Supreme Court for a, a statewide manual recount. The next day, on December 9th, in a 5-4 decision, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the manual recounts must halt and agreed to hear oral arguments from both parties. On December 11th, both parties presented their cases, Bush, Bush's team arguing that the Florida Supreme Court exceeded its authority when it authorized the manual recount. Gore's team arguing the case had already been decided at the state level and was not a matter for the federal courts. The U.S. in a seven, I'm sorry, the U.S. Supreme Court in a seven to two vote overturned the Florida decision, ruling that the Florida Supreme Court had violated the Equal Protection Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. And in the end, the justices ruled five to four on the entire matter. The majority arguing that the Florida Supreme Court's decision to hold a statewide recount created a new election law, something that only a state legislature could do. Writing for the five-justice majority, Antonin Scalia stated that the votes were ordered to be counted were not, quote, legal votes, those in which there's a clear indication of the intent of the voter. So the recount would do irreparable harm to Bush and the integrity of the democratic process. The dissenters, including Justice Ginsburg, felt the real threat to the democratic process was not ordering a recount. Despite being flawed, they said a recount should be al allowed to proceed because no vote should have a deadline to be counted. One noteworthy aspect to Ginsburg's dissent, she ended it with, I dissent, rather than the traditional, I respectfully dissent. At number six, we have Ledbetter versus Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company out of, from 2007. This comes from my very first legal home jurisdiction of Gadsden, Alabama. Over the course of her nearly two-decade career at the Goodyear plant, Lily Ledbetter faced sexual harassment and was told by her employer that women shouldn't be working there. Ledbetter was one of just a few female supervisors. Because salaried employees were given or denied raises based on performance evaluations, Ledbetter believed she was being shortchanged compared to her male counterparts. Goodyear forbade employees to discuss pay, so Ledbetter didn't have solid proof of any sex-based discrimination until she received an anonymous note listing the salaries of the three male managers. That's when she learned she had been paid 40% less than men with equal jobs in her division. Ledbetter filed her suit in November of 1998, retired retirement and claim discrimination under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits employers from discriminating against employees on the basis of 
sex, race, color, national origin, and religion. The district court awarded Ledbetter over $3.5 million in back pay and damages. Justice Ginsburg unfortunately wrote a passionate dissent arguing that pay disparities often occur, as they did in Ledbetter's case in small increments. Cause to suspect that discrimination is at work develops only time. Comparative pay information, moreover, is often hidden from the employee's view. Employers may keep under wraps the pay differentials maintained among supervisors, no less the reason for those differentials. Small initial discrepancies may not be seen as meat for a federal case, particularly when the employee is trying to succeed in a non-traditional environment and is averse to making waves. At number five, we've got Shelby County versus Holder from 2013. Congress enacted the Voting Rights Act in 1965 to banish the blight of racial discrimination in voting. Until President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the piece of federal legislation at the height of the civil rights movement, racial discrimination was rampant in voting. Certain sections of the act created rules meant to protect it from changes down the road. According to the Supreme Court 5-4 to four majority opinion, Section 4 of the act was in fact deemed unconstitutional because it imposed burdens that no longer made sense in the modern era and represented an unconstitutional violation of the power to regulate elections, which are supposed to be governed by the states themselves. In another major dissent, Ginsburg argued that the amendments support Congress's authority to enact legislation specifically targeting potential states' abuses as long as the Congress demonstrates that the means taken rationally advance a a legitimate objective like the Voting Rights Act. In her typical eloquence, eloquence, RBG wrote, throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory charges is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. At number four, I've got Burrell versus Hobby Lobby from 2014. The national arts and crafts chain known as Hobby Lobby consists of more than 500 stores with 13,000 employees, and the Green family is ahead of it all. The Greens deem the use of certain contraception, including Plan V and two different IUDs, as immoral because they believe that they cause abortion. However, thanks to the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, the ACA, employment-based group health plans are required to provide certain types of preventative care to employees, and that includes FDA-approved birth control methods. Exemptions were in place for religious employers and nonprofit religious institutions, though those types of exemptions weren't meant for for for-profit businesses like Hobby Lobby. The Supreme Court ruled 5-4 to in favor of Hobby Lobby. That decision means that the U.S. government can now cannot require employers to provide insurance for coverage for birth control if it conflicts with the employer's religious beliefs. In the majority of opinion, Justice Alito argued that the owners of the business have the religious objections to abortion, and according to their religious beliefs, the four contraceptive methods at issue are abortifacians. But... Here comes RBJ, and she delivered an impassioned dissent, arguing that the ACA's contraceptive mandate served as the least restrictive way possible for the government to ensure women had access to contraception. She cited research conducted by Guttmacher Institute that predicted contraception would reduce unintended pregnancies and abortions in the United States, and she argued that by exempting for-profit operations organizations, the government was preventing women from receiving contraceptive care and jeopardizing female employees' health and well-being. At number three, we've got Obergefell versus Hodge of 2015. Fourteen same-sex couples two, and two men whose same-sex partners had passed away filed suits in their home states of Michigan, Kentucky, Ohio, and Tennessee. At the time, 
All four of these states defined marriage as a union between one man and one woman. The petitioner said that this narrow definition violated the 14th Amendment because it denied them the right to get married or have the marriage they'd received in other states re- legally recognized at home. Ginsburg voted with the majority on this one. In the 5-4 ruling that held that same-sex marriage bans are indeed violations of the 14th Amendment's due process and equal protection clause. The Constitution promises liberty to all within its reach. Justice Anthony Kennedy wrote in the majority opinion, a liberty that includes certain specific rights that allow persons with a lawful realm to define and express their identity. The landmark civil right case legalized same-sex marriage across the United States, giving hundreds of thousands of LGBTQ Americans the same rights and protections guaranteed to heterosexual couples by both the Due Process Clause and the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution. Love. And number two, I've got Artists versus District of Columbia from 2017. A District of Columbia Department of Health code inspector named Stephanie Artis filed a discrimination claim with the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission against her employer in 2009, alleging that her supervisor had singled her out unfairly. The following year, her claim was still pending. The DOH terminated her employment. The year after that, Artis sued the district in federal court, saying it had violated Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits employers from discriminating against federal employees on the basis of sex, race, color, national origin, or religion. The federal district court ruled against her and dismissed the case. The Supreme Court was tasked with deciding whether the tolling position that stopped the statute of limitations period in which to file a lawsuit entirely or whether U.S. Code 28, Section 1367, only allowed for a 30-day grace period to refile claims in a state or a local court following a federal court's determination that it lacks jurisdiction. By a vote of 5-4, to four, the court reversed the D.C. Superior Court's ruling. The majority adopted the so-called stop-the-clock interpretation proffered by artists. Ginsburg delivered the opinion of the court, which held that the tolling provision suspended the statute of limitations clock with the federal case was pending. This meant artists should have been given the remainder of her statute of limitation, plus 30 days to file her claim in D.C. court. And at number one, I've got Sessions versus Demia, Demaya, <laughs> a case cons- Concerning the definition of aggravated felonies came before the Supreme Court as it relates to immigration policies. An aggravated felony includes, quote, a crime of violence as defined in 18 U.S.C. Section 16. The Immigration and National Nationality Act, INA, guaranteed that anyone convicted of an aggravated felony after entering the United States would be deported. James... Demeya, a lawful permanent U.S. resident who had emigrated from the Philippines in 1992, had two convictions for first-degree burglary under California law. After his second offense, the government considered him an aggravated felon who should be deported. The government argued that the conviction fell within the residual clause of the definition of a violent crime, which included any other offense that is a felony and that, by its nature, involves a substantial risk that physical force against the person or the property of another may be used in the course of committing the offense. One interesting twist regarding the ruling is, aside from striking down the key provision of a statute that allows the expulsion of certain non-citizens, the ruling marked the first time Ginsburg was assigned a majority opinion. Justices are assigned opinions based on seniority, and because Ginsburg voted with the majority in Sessions versus DeMeya, she wrote was the most senior in line. She assigned the opinion to Justice Elena Kagan, who wrote, three terms ago in Johnson's versus the United States, this court held that part of a federal law's definition of violent felony was impermissibly vague. The question in this case is whether a similar, similarly worded 
clause in a statute's definition of crime of violence suffers the same constitutional defect. And adhering to our analysis in Johnson, we hold that it does. So that's my number one. And I hope that Ruth Bader Ginsburg memory is a revolution. Thank you for blazing the trail for the women who are following you. And thank you for listening to this podcast. Find us on your favorite podcast app at GSMC Financial News Podcast. Find me on Twitter at GSMC Financial News Podcast. And if you could, give me a five-star review on your favorite podcast app because that'll help me. Um, And if you have any questions or comments about today's episode, hit me up on Twitter. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your week. And remember... You've been listening to the GSMC Financial News Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type GSMC into your favorite podcast app to find all of the shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, from business news to weird news. Please subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you've enjoyed today's podcast. Thank you.